Have you seen one picture of a single dead Hamas terrorist in the fighting in Gaza? Not one. Is that yeah, by accident have, or is that because Hamas no, can control Hamas but, can Mark, control the information? You, know, you asked me a question and, and you Gaza. said you would be brief. I have I haven't, you're right. But I have seen lots of children with my own lying eyes being pulled from the rubble. Not because they're the you pictures don't... Hamas wants you to see. Exactly my point, they're, they're, dead, they're Mark. the pictures also Hamas wants... But there are also people no. that your government has uh, killed. You accept that, right? You've killed children? Or do you deny no, that? No, I do not. I do not. I do not. First of all, you don't know how those people died. Those children. Oh, wow. First of all, we don't want to see a we single do. child have... killed. Okay, here's a, here's we don't want to see a single child killed. I agree with you. I agree with you. We shouldn't blindly believe anything Hamas says. But why should we believe Correct. what your government says either? Your military spokesman on Monday pointed to an Arabic document in the basement of a Gaza hospital and claimed it was a guardian list on which every terrorist writes his name. But that was false. It was just a calendar with the days of the week on it. Your colleague in the prime minister's office, Ophir Gendelman, posted behind the scenes footage from a Lebanese short film and claimed it was Palestinians in Gaza faking their own injuries. That tweet is still up a week later. That is endless disinformation from your government, is it not? I disagree. And I think on the important issues, look, I'll give you an example, Mehdi. No, no, Originally, no, no. we no, 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 estimated... No, I'm answering your question. Mark. Allow me to answer your question. I'm okay. answering your question directly, if you'll allow me. But you're dodging my question, Mark. I'm not why sure that's you, true. I'm not sure that's true. Why did your military spokesman on Monday point to a calendar in Arabic and say, these are the names of terrorists on them? That's false. Can you accept that here and now? I, 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 I'm not aware of the, uh, the, the incident. Let's put up the so image. We have the image. You have I, no I can't read Arabic. It doesn't help me. I have well, no comment. You, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the does incident. Does your spokesman but, uh, read you, Hang on. I have a question, Maddie. You're a journalist. Have you made a professional mistake ever? Not no, intentionally, but have you made a professional I'm, I'm, mistake? I'm, exactly. And I own up to it. Have so you can made you own ever, up to the mistake? So can, can, not, so can you own up to so, the mistake? So I've made mistakes. You've made mistakes. But there's a difference between making an honest mistake and between Hamas that deliberately exaggerates numbers to suit its propaganda purposes. There's a huge understood. difference. So it sounds like... It's like it's, it sounds, so, so hold on, hold on. You said propaganda. Can we just deal with your colleague Ophir Gendelman's tweet? It's still up seven days later. Why has it not come down? It's a Lebanese short film. We can put it on screen. It's not Palestinians faking their own injuries. Can we own up to that mistake and take that down? Is that not propaganda? I, uh, uh, once again, I understand that that was also a mistake. And, so why is it still uh, up seven I'll days later? I'll speak to Ophir about it, if you like. I'll speak to Ophir about it, if you like. He's Great. a friend of mine okay. and a colleague. I quite like him. He's a good man. He's actually very effective. Why is he effective? Well, he speaks a uh, mother tongue, Lebanon Arabic. Tweet, Mark. I, Mark, I agree. He made a mistake. But let's be, clear, right. let's be clear. It's very good that we have someone who can speak Arabic on in the Arab networks to the, to the, directly to Arab people so they can hear Israeli opinions directly. I appreciate and that. is amazing at that. He's very Great. important. <laughs> OK, thank you, Mark. I know you're short on time, much more short than me, so I'm going to keep going. What threat did Razan al-Najjar 21-year-old volunteer paramedic uh, who was shot while wearing a white uniform in the chest 100 meters away from the fence. What threat did she pose to Israeli snipers? Wait a minute. This is something I really looked into. Okay. She, I'm glad someone Yes. Did. She was having an incendiary bomb and there is an investigation by the IDF, so she was a threat. But I have another question for Where's you. Where's your... Why, no, 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 why before... was she... Why was she going into why? a... You know why she was going. Zone. Because no, you're killing her people and she's no. a paramedic. You could choose not to kill people at a fence who are just damaging a fence, allegedly, as the UN, the EU, Med international lawyers have said. No other country shoots people in this way, Med in the back as they're running away. Let me ask you this. Yasser Murtaja, journalist, 30 years old, shot in the stomach by an Israeli sniper. He was uh, 250 meters away from the fence. Why was he, why was it, what knife does he carry? What knife Maybe is he carrying? You can quote hundreds of names. If you look at them individually, I feel bad for them and for their families, even if they were I'm coming to harm us. Bad. I'm asking how do you justify I'm saying killing? because they came with a harm intention. If they were Where's coming to- Where's your proof of that? Of Yasser al murtaja was not Hamas, was a journalist, your country shot him in the stomach, he, and you claim he had a hurtful intention. That's an outrageous claim to make someone who's dead without any anyone, evidence. That's anyone, literally smearing no, no. the dead. Anyone who goes into a war zone knows exactly what he's doing. What is a they're, war zone? When they come and attack us, it's a war zone. He wasn't attacking you. If you pull a gun, you aim at someone, you shoot them. Remember, the Israeli Maybe. military bragged on Twitter, we know where every bullet landed. Maybe you go around the circle to the same point. And the point is that we have a border you don't, border. Border. you don't have a border. You don't have a border, Danny. To cross it, Danny, not Gaza with flowers, is occupied territory. Not with candies, this nonsense that you have a border bombs, is absurd. Yes, look, well, Gaza is occupied I'm territory. I'm sorry. The people that are living in an open no, air prison no. camp, and you're I, saying I it's a border. Differ. I beg to differ. Gaza you is beg not to differ with the United Nations, territory. the European because Union, Gaza was the International Criminal to, Court, no, every Western government. The International Committee for the Red Cross says Gaza is being treated with collective punishment. That's the view of the ICRC. Can I ask a question? Does Israel control Gaza's borders, airspace, and territorial waters? Yes or no? No. 
No. No. Really? It's right. No. Wow. Because I'll You're just going to come here and say barefaced falsehood. No, the things. So are fishermen not who go beyond no. six miles Listen. and get shot, they just imagine the bullets hitting them. And when General Zvika Vogel, former head of Southern Command, said in April, if a child or anyone else gets close to the fence, his punishment is death. You support I, that death penalty for anyone who comes near a fence? I, I don't agree to that, except if he is holding a weapon. Mohammed Ibrahim Ayoub, 14 years old, was not holding any weapon. The Israeli sniper shot him in the head. Did he deserve to die? No one deserves to die. So why did the Israeli sniper shoot him in kill, the head? Unless they aim to kill. He wasn't aiming to kill. So why was I'm he shot in the sure. head? I'm not sure. If you look at the, if you look at the, at the facts. What are the facts? The facts I mean, you don't are... Do, there's no transparent investigations. You don't allow any international investigators in. And then you say, trust you, that the nurse had a bomb and a 14-year-old guy was going to kill a sniper. I do trust the Israeli military. I do trust the Israeli Supreme Court, which is very much trusted by all the world. Israel is transparent. That's Israel, well, I'm sorry. It's not what human Listen, rights groups in Israel say, say. I may say things which may be inconvenient truth. They're also but. not true. How else do you get rid of Hamas if you don't go about it in the blunt, brutal manner that Israel is doing? And if you do it the way they're doing it, how do you avoid the kind of casualty rate of people under 18, given that that's half the population. So, three things very briefly. Number one, you do it by not deliberately targeting civilian targets and schools and hospitals and cemeteries and mosques and universities and churches. You don't have snipers shooting at hospitals or Christian women inside a church. That's how you avoid the casualties. Number two, I don't accept the premise of your question that this is the way to defeat Hamas. I think even if I'm an Israeli hawk, I criticize Netanyahu and say, this is not the way to defeat Hamas. This is actually absurd to think you can defeat Hamas in this way. We have countless episodes from history that show us this is not how you defeat a guerrilla movement, a resistance movement, a terror group, as you say, whatever word you want to use. In fact, you have Israeli generals saying this can't be done in this way. And number three, look, the reality is Hamas is a symptom of the problem. As long as you treat Hamas as the problem rather than as a symptom of the problem, you're never going to get rid of Hamas. Or if you do, by some fantasy means, get rid of Hamas, you'll just get another version of Hamas because now you've got tens of thousands of orphans You've got people who've lost their kids, their spouses, their siblings. What, you think they're not going to fight back in the years to come? You, know, you think they're not going to take well, revenge? Well, that's how I feel. I mean, absolute look, I, madness to listen, believe. I feel, I feel the same way. I, then I we know. agree. I think you're being a little too generous to the Israelis here. And, and with the greatest respect, I think your questions reflect a little bit of a naivety about what Israel's doing here. You're, you're starting from the premise that Israel is trying to defeat Hamas. I don't accept that premise. I don't believe that's what Israel is trying to do. What do you do think they're trying they to do? Would, they wouldn't be doing it this way. I think they're trying to take back Gaza. I think they're trying to erase the resistance in Gaza. I think they're trying to get rid of the people from Gaza. I think this is their, you know, they've mowed the lawn, as they put it in previous wars. This time they're going in to erase the population. You know, they, you know there's a plausible genocide. Okay, but let me, okay, so, the so let me ask you that. Justice. If right. you listen, hold on, if you listen to Israeli officials, as you know, it's laid out mm. in the South African petition, they are very genocidal in their approach to flattening and burning down Gaza. It's not about destroying Hamas. And if it was about destroying Hamas, why has Netanyahu and Smotrich and others talked about how Hamas is an asset to Israel? Why do they say that openly, Piers? Mehdi, why is Israel singled out. Yeah, I don't accept the premise of the question, obviously. It's interesting you should say that Israel singled out. There's a little R going out. Well, if you're watching this on YouTube, go back on YouTube and see that the first Intelligence Squared debate I did was not about Israel. I came here a few months ago to talk about the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and its human rights abuses. So before I even turned up for Israel, I came to condemn Saudi Arabia. And on and this, I get it, I get it. There are lots of UN resolutions uh, condemning Israel, I get that. But if you look at actual practical sanctions, there are no sanctions on Israel from Western countries for human rights abuses. There are against Syria, there are against Russia, there are against Iran, there are against North Korea. So no, I don't think Israel's being singled out. I'd actually like to see sanctions put on Israel so it's treated like other human rights abusers. Consistency, single standard. I mean, I would be critical of your double standards, Biz. You constantly criticize Hamas for genocidal goals. And I just pointed out to you that the Israeli finance minister said this week he wanted the total annihilation of Gaza. Do you agree that's genocide? No, listen, I, I definitely think some of the members of that cabinet have used rhetoric, which I think borders on genocidal, no question. But it's not as blatant. Borders. Why well, not just why genocidal, saying, Biz? Why borders? Well, OK. I, look, you say it's genocidal. <laughs> total I would annihilation say, of Gaza. Yeah, I would say it's deeply inflammatory rhetoric, but it's not quite the same as the Hamas spokesman saying on camera after October the 7th, 
We are going to keep doing this again and again and again. That, that's different. It's much that, worse. That is because a, these that Israelis is a, are literally doing it as we speak. And they have a charter to get it's rid of... It's much worse, Piers. They have a because charter Israelis to eliminate Israel. Because Israelis tens of thousands of people. Yeah, but see, but they have tens my of problem, thousands listen, of Palestinians. You and I... So, you and I many, so we, does, hold on, hold on, hold on, Piers. Okay. So does the Likud Party. So does the Likud Party. 1977, Likud Party Charter. What does it say? Between the sea and the Jordan, no. there will only be Israeli sovereignty. River to the sea. That's the liquid charter, Piers. I haven't heard you criticise the liquid charter. Douglas, you're the guy... No, sorry, sorry, let's just be clear. You're the guy who denied earlier that what you said in the spectator... Let's just be con the clear conduct. We're talking about October 7th, October 7th. Five days after October 7th, you said, maybe they will finally put an end to this insoluble nightmare. Raise Hamas to the ground or clear all the Palestinians from that benighted strip. It could be a good time to do it. But I you tell this audience, no, we can live in peace side by side. No, That's a war crime. No. Ethnic cleansing is a war crime. Not at all. Clearing people. Not, no, I said maybe for a reason. It which could you be a good it, time to do oh, it. Oh, for goodness oh, sake. Oh, Douglas. Goodness sake. Just apologize and move on. Brilliant. Seriously. As Israel's atrocities in Gaza have become ever more clear, committed Zionists have been forced to dismiss an ever wider range of international institutions. As Mehdi Hassan found out at a recent debate. I want you to also offer defense of international institutions at this moment as it relates to holding the state of Israel to account. I have just, I have just one sentence to say about that, is that the entire world wants a ceasefire and the United States and Israel and, I don't know, the Micronesia and whatever else don't, right? The entire world takes a very different view, unfortunately, to the people in this room and to Douglas and Natasha. Is that, is that uh, the International fire? Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice, the, uh, the UNHCR, UNICEF, uh, Doctors Without Borders, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Oxfam, uh, Christian Aid. Yep, you're booing. What does it come to when you're booing Oxfam? What does that tell you about yourselves? You're sitting here booing Oxfam to defend Benjamin Netanyahu. Let me just deal with something you just said. You talked about debunking propaganda. First of all, you can't even get Israeli propaganda straight. The Israeli government's own security agency, Shin Bet, investigated what you just said and said, no, we found no evidence that workers from Gaza were involved in the October 7th attack. Oh, oh Shin Bet are lying. They're booing Shin Bet, the Israeli security that. service. Got it. The Knesset has time and again been asked the simple question, is Israel a state that's founded on equality or is there no equality? And time and again, it will not allow a simple law that calls for equality. And the fundamental problem is that they do not recognize my right to exist. There Listen, you have you ever been arrested by Israeli police? Have you ever been beaten by Israeli police? Have yes, you been ever- Yes, actually oh, I have. Well, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell yeah. me about it. Probably, uh, yes, oh, I, I still yeah. I got the best question to ask the Palestinians. Yes, yes, yes. I, I really feel, you can check the bruises. She's all bruised up, right? Let's just be clear. First, you're saying that if you haven't been beaten by the Israeli police, you're an equal member of society. And then when someone says they have been beaten by Israeli police, you say, where are the bruises? No, no, listen. I'm just, I'm asking to clarify. She went to school. Test. Was she denied education? Was she denied social... Uh, uh, so that's your definition. Denied, what is your definition? Hold on. In, in, she is Israeli, black, just people, like me. Black Americans during the Jim Crow era could go to school. It doesn't mean that there wasn't massive segregation and discrimination against this black is Americans. But there's no... It's a but weird, Israelis, weird criteria. No, but Jews and Arabs can go to school do together, support, and they do. Do go to school there together. Are, there were protests on TV just a few weeks ago. Israelis were saying they didn't want to sell a house in their town to a Palestinian fine. family. And how, many Arabs, and how many Arabs? That's fine. Did you say that's fine? Israeli. Listen. Did you say that's fine to Israeli people protesting against the sale of a house no, in their town? Are you okay with that? They can protest, which is good. Are you saying it's good, your words, for people to protest against the sale of a house to a Palestinian family to keep the town Jewish only? Because that's what I just said happened, and you said fine, and then you said good. Are you okay with that? Listen. You have people here and there who I do not believe that they are right. But so you would condemn those protests. So would you condemn those protests? Because a moment ago you said it's good that they're protesting. Because it's a democratic society. But it's a you can protest. protest. You don't have to be okay with the you protest. You can protest whatever you want. But it's you called, condemn those called, protests. It's called freedom of expression. And, and, and I'm asking you to give us some free speech. Do you condemn those protests? I condemn anything which is biased against race, I'll ask religion, again. gender. Do you condemn those protests, Danny? Do you condemn is such or what they represent? Whatever you like, Daddy. Just do something. Say, give me an answer. I condemn any racism. Okay. okay. General statement. You won't no, condemn those protests, though. I would condemn them. Oh wow. Okay, we got that. In your view, is killing 274 Palestinians, including many children, an acceptable price to pay for the freeing of four Israelis? 
like I said, I, I, I don't. This, you, you want a clear answer, yeah. and you want to make a, you want to make this black and Isn't white. Isn't it an acceptable no, price to pay? It's, it's an unacceptable price, but I think it's a price that has to be paid. Wow. Okay. So, how many Palestinians would it be acceptable to kill in order to get back a single hostage? What's the upper limit? Would four hundred? Oh, when, when we start talking about human lives, every single one, one life is too many. And let me just, I mean, let's, but let's be human But you've just said 274 is a price that because, has to be paid. Because I'm saying if it was 1,000, would you pay that? Because Meti, in, because in my estimation, if we, if, we look at, if we look at questions like this in a vacuum, of course, we're going to come up with different answers than in the context okay, of, let me of the entire quarter. challenge of the Middle so East. Because, because if we, we are increasingly seeing, the United States of America in particular, as unwilling to sometimes do what's necessary to demonstrate some strength and prevent... I mean, you which, Congressman, no, no, no. you just said a moment ago we have a history of killing thousands of innocent people. I, we okay. do. And my father, I, my father died yes. in a war that, so, that was... So let, was, I, I do need to ask well, the question for the value of Palestinian life. I understand, life. yes. So if you're saying that to get free people from the clutches of horrible captivity, hostages, people possibly being abused in captivity, to free them, you have to pay a price, there right? It's a price. horrible price. Does that ratio work the other way? How many Israelis can Palestinians kill in order to free Palestinian detainees who are currently being tortured in Israeli captivity, some of them being raped to death, according to the New York Times last week. Can they kill 200 Israelis? You're, you're, you're hold on, hold on, let me finish the question. No, can they kill 200 Israelis to free four Palestinians who are being tortured in an Israeli prison? I think it's a question that I'm sure uh, Palestinians are asking the same way as Israelis. But no, but, but, no, 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 you answered, you, it, you, you you answered some, it for Israel. Let, let, let I would just, like you to answer it in reverse. Let, let, me, let me just clarify something you just said. You said Palestinian prisoners are being raped to death by Israeli soldiers? Yes, this is a soldiers? report in the New York Times last yeah, week. I, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't believe that to be true. Nonetheless, the question... A 41-year-old question... detainee said, the interrogators made me sit on something like a hot metal stick and it felt like fire. Another, mm -hmm. He said another detainee died after they put the electric stick up his anus. No, it's repulsive. This is an Israeli dungeon that CNN mm -hmm. and New York Times are both reported oh, on. So to free true, people from that prison, mm -hmm. can you kill lots of innocent people according to the logic of the raid in Gaza? What, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, if you represent the Palestinian people, you re represent the Israeli people, we look at this quite differently. I don't want to I know say, you do, and, which and, is why no, I'm and, asking and the question, Congressman. And, and, and I understand and, that you see it differently. Me, A lot of people watching at home say, why? Why aren't yeah. all lives equal? They should be. But they're they not. Well, then let's to go, you. But then, but then let's go. Look, I don't. What I don't want to do is get in a debate of who suffered worse, whose I'm lives. Not are, by the way, I'm asking about Palis our Palestinian lives equally. Innocent Palestinian lives matter just as much as innocent Israeli lives, Muslim lives as much as Jewish and Christian lives. That's who I am. So, now, with all that said, with all that said, war is hell, and this is nauseating. And we're yeah, trying I worry to get about back. this line, war is hell, because can't Hamas say the same thing when you accuse them of war crime? They can say war is hell. Yes, yes, Isn't that why we have rules yes, to war? Can. Yes, so that we can. stop it from yes, being hell. Yes, they can. War is hell. Let me just deal with a few things that Douglas said, because there were a few things were said. I mean, it's, look, it's amusing. I wasn't surprised at all. I came to a debate in Toronto to debate uh, Israel with two, two defenders of the current government. And so far, Gideon and I, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't call, we could have done a long list of your apologists for genocide and war crimes and crimes against humanity. We didn't do that, but we've been called liars and Hamas supporters. And I get it. None, not, neither of us talked about Hamas. We don't support Hamas. This is not a debate about Hamas. I know Douglas wants to redefine it as a debate about Hamas. Great, good for him, because he can't actually deal with the arguments we're putting forward, all the Jews who are putting forward these arguments. They're all anti-Semites, remember. I just want to deal with one point very important here. Douglas is the great journalist in Israel. I love this. Cosplaying as a journalist, going into Gaza with the IDF. Douglas interviewed Benjamin Netanyahu in January. Douglas did not... Uh, you're very bothered by Qatar and funding That's Hamas. they're your bosses. But, well, we're talking about bosses. Let's, let's talk to this. You're literally what, paid well, by what, them. What, 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 I've, I've interviewed... I've interviewed Qatari officials. You can go on YouTube and watch my interviews with Qatari officials. And then you can watch Douglas interview Benjamin Netanyahu where he asked him pearls like, is there another chapter left in the Netanyahu biography? Oh, that, that was the strong that. question. Oh, he didn't ask insane. Benjamin Netanyahu, why did you work with Qatar to fund Hamas all those yeah, years? Yeah. Why did you prop up Hamas all those years? Why, according to today's Israeli media, did you have reports that there was going to be attack on your citizens and completely allow that to happen? Douglas didn't ask any of those questions. Instead, he'd like to spray around Hamas at the Muslim on the stage. Oh. Douglas referred to Hamza Youssef, the first minister of Scotland recently, as the first minister of Gaza. Yes, Muslim guy, he and he said, quote, you, come to you said, quote, he has infiltrated our system. Given we're in a debate about anti-Semitism, 
I find it ironic that you are throwing out some of the most well, bigoted, dual loyalty well, tropes no, known to man, the referring to a born, a born British Muslim politician as the first minister of Gaza. So the moment you have a pro-Palestinian guest who wants to avoid calling what Hamas did an act of terrorism by terrorists, I think it's very revealing about their mindset. And I think it's the wrong mindset. Here's my problem with that. Why is that not applied to your Israeli guests? I would, I would, be, I would be fine, Piers, if you had Palestinian guests and you begin by asking them, do you condemn Hamas war crimes? Because what Hamas did on October 7th was a war crime. But then you should start with Israeli guests and pro-Israeli guests saying, do you condemn Israeli war crimes, which have been documented by the UN, every human rights group on the planet. You don't. You had Naftali Bennett, the former Israeli prime minister, on a couple of weeks ago. I watched the interview. Your opening question was, how comfortable are you with the way Israel's prosecuting the war? Right. Bit of a softball to start with. You didn't ask him to condemn Israel. Israeli terrorism, Israeli war crimes, Israeli genocide in Gaza. So a lot of people look at that and they say, I, they get your intention, but it comes across as a bit of a racist double standard. How many nuclear weapons does Iran have as of today? Right now, I hope none. Okay, how many does Israel have? No idea. No idea? You were in the government. They don't tell you that stuff. No idea. Who do they tell? No idea. I'm telling you, I uh, never discussed it. But it's, it's irrelevant. It's between, you never discussed Israel's nuclear weapons. You can say that hand on heart, you've never discussed Israel's nuclear weapons. You're expecting us to believe that the Deputy Foreign Minister of Israel never discussed Israel's nuclear deterrent. Seriously, then? No. So let, tell, let me tell you, no? It's not all slogans and sound bites, Mehdi. Tell yourself. I did friend. not discuss Israel nuclear weapons. I did discuss Israel nuclear policy. There is a big difference. Okay. 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 So now we've got past that semantic evasion. No, no, you have to... <laughs> you How have many to... nuclear weapons does Israel have? Because experts say it's anywhere between 80 and 400. So what? So, so what? what? Yeah, so what? So, has Israel ever so threatened... Do you recognize the hypocrisy of Israel no. having a secret illicit nuclear weapons program that it won't open up its doors to and won't talk about and then lecturing everyone else in the region Absolutely about nuclear weapons? Absolutely not. You know why? Absolutely. <laughs> you talk about hypocrisy. Yes, the question for me that's caused me a moral quandary is what is an acceptably proportionate level of response. And I don't know the answer, but I don't think you can call people responding to an act of terror on that scale terrorists for responding. What you can do is hold them to account. The problem, say, the problem if, Piers, if is breaking... if you go to Gaza, if you go to Gaza, Piers, and you talk to Palestinians, they will say that Hamas were responding. If we play the who started it game, we go back many decades. Well, when, did Israel, have is a consistent when did Israel moral kill? Uh, over, what we need to have is. Well, hang on. When, when did Israel to, kill 1,200 Israel Palestinians? Kill of Palestinian civilians. When did they kill 800 Palestinian civilians in one few hour period, right, in the way that Hamas killed but those But that's not Israelis. the definition of terrorism, how many hours you do it in. I can mention many Israeli massacres going back to Sabra and Shatila, which they oversaw, going back to Kibia and Ariel Sharon, going back to Deir Yassin, where rape and violence happened. The point is not to compare atrocities. The point, Piers, is to have a consistent moral principle, which is to say, if you kill civilians for a political cause, mm. you are a terrorist. On that basis, Hamas have committed acts of terror and Israel have committed acts of terror. I think that's only fair to say that. The reality is, Abi, that the obstacle to a hostage deal has always been Benjamin Netanyahu, and those are not my words. Those are the words of Haim Rubinstein, the former spokesperson for the hostages' family, who told the Israeli press last week that Netanyahu's been the obstacle. He says that they found out there was a deal on the table back on October 9th, 10th, to get hostages released, but Netanyahu hid it from them. Those are the words of the spokesperson for the Israeli families of the hostages. And he hid it from them because he knows that if he agrees to a hostage deal, his fascist colleagues and his coalition government will collapse his government. This is Israeli domestic politics. Lieutenant Colonel, what about that? I mean, if the hostages are all released, shouldn't Israel seriously consider ending hostilities in Gaza and allowing for a political settlement that leads to the future? Yeah, I'm listening to the second edition of uh, Mehdi Hassan's monologue that I saw earlier, and it's not surprising that uh, you're parroting Hamas talking points. Uh, really, the let's put things here in perspective. We have a terrorist organization that abducted civilians and soldiers. They're the ones for the last four months have been refusing any deal that Israel, the US, Qatar, Egypt, and others have put forward. And now, when push comes to shove, and when they see Israeli tanks lined up on their way to Rafah, all of a sudden, they are agreeing. They're agreeing to something that wasn't on the table. And it's quite absurd that this is even how it's covered. And it's classic deception 101 by an organization that is very savvy in deception and unfortunately has uh, figureheads and mouthpieces all over Western media doing their work, whether it's Al Jazeera or other places, and getting that message out that Israel is the problem when Israeli civilians and soldiers are the ones that have been abducted.
I'll let Betty has respond to that. So I think all of your viewers saw me quote the spokesperson for the Israeli hostages' families. And the colonel then said, I'm parroting Hamas talking points. He's referring to the hostages' families as Hamas, as parroting Hamas talking points, because I quoted them. I didn't quote Hamas. In fact, tonight, the colonel knows that hundreds of people went to Netanyahu's house and screamed, you have blood on your hands, Israeli protesters. I guess they're all Hamas. Right? The Israeli position now is anyone who disagrees with them is Hamas. I'm guessing that tomorrow they'll say CIA director Bill Burns, who was involved in this hostage negotiation deal, he's Hamas too. Everyone's Hamas. And as for deception, I mean, come on. The colonel was a spokesperson for the IDF, which has spent the last six months lying. Abby, your network has debunked multiple lies that the Israeli military has told. CNN's Jeremy Diamond, I urge all your viewers to go and watch your colleague Jeremy Diamond's report on 10 kids killed in the Al Maghazi refugee camp last month. The Israelis said we had nothing to do with it. And yet Jeremy interviewed three munitions experts who looked at the evidence and said, yeah, Israel killed those 10 kids. So when we talk about deception, we're, we're learning from the masters here. The proposition tonight have sprayed around the word lie and liar, so let's return the compliment. Natasha lied when she talked about UNRWA and terrorism. The UN set up an independent inquiry, asked the Israelis for evidence. I know you don't want to hear this. The Israelis, the, they asked the Israelis, she's parroting propaganda from the Israeli government. The Israeli government was asked to give the evidence. They refused to give their evidence. Every Western government, including your own, Canada's, has restarted funding because they looked at the evidence and didn't see it. That's great. I get it, I get it, I get it. But, but as Douglas might have once said, facts don't care about your feelings. To come back to the other point of lie, Douglas says the war would end if Hamas gave back the hostages. Complete lie. The Israelis have said, even if the hostages come back, we carry on the war. In fact, I interviewed Avraham Munter's nephew. Avraham Munter is a 79-year-old Israeli hostage right now. Poor guy, tragic. 79-year-old in captivity, should be freed, of course, had to have his birthday in captivity. His nephew says that every time he goes on the streets, Ben Gavir's police beat him. They beat him and arrest him. They're arresting hostage family members. And they're coming on TV and saying, why are we being used as props by people who support the war? He doesn't support the war. He wants a deal. Israeli family members are going on the streets and being tear gassed on water cannon, whatever, beaten by the police because they want a deal and they want an end to the war that Douglas and Zasha so proudly support. They keep telling us about the horrors of October the 7th. I agree. This side shares the revulsion against the horrors of October the 7th, but we also share revulsion against the horrors that came since October the 7th. We don't support those horrors. I'm opposed to the war crimes that happened on October the 7th and the war crimes that have happened since October the 7th. <laughs> Douglas, now I've got to finish this point. Yeah. Douglas, the week after October the 7th, came out in The Spectator and advocated for the ethnic cleansing of Gaza, which is a crime against humanity oh, under the Rome statute. He said, now is a... Not true. You said, now is a good time to do it. Okay. Douglas earlier was telling us all about the importance of journalism going on the ground. While Douglas was getting awards from the president of Israel, we were actually reporting my news organization's Zateo from those campuses with Jewish students. In fact, oh. the most read piece on our site is from a student called Jonathan Ben Menachem, who is at Columbia and reported from inside the encampment where they were having a Seder, where he was protesting uh, war crimes in Gaza, which I know the other side thinks there are no war crimes, everything we just imagined the last eight months. Um, what you have to tackle tonight, I'm glad we brought up college co campuses, because again, if this ridiculous sweeping motion, Douglas says complexity, we are the side of complexity, we're not the ones saying anti-Zionism across the board is anti-Semitism, you have to deal with the fact that college protests are disproportionate, there are a disproportionate number of Jews in these protests. They're all brainwashed, they're all idiots, they're all self-haters. Some of the top academics at Columbia University who are Jewish have come out to defend the protests. Annalise Orlek is a 65-year-old former chair of Jewish studies at Dartmouth. She was beaten on camera by police while she was protesting against the war in Gaza. Apparently Douglas, an atheist, says that she's an anti-Semite. That's the debate, that's what we've got to tonight. Where the former chair of Jewish studies at Dartmouth is an anti-Semite, while Douglas is the champion of the Jewish people. I find it bizarre, and I'm glad we brought up college protests because it's the number one evidence right now in our discourse that actually a lot of young Jewish people, and by the way, this whole argument, why didn't you protest Sudan? Why didn't you protest Syria? Last time I checked, the United States Congress does not fund Bashar al-Assad or the RSF militias in Sudan.